Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this month's uh, episode of the Teaching and Learning webinar for EdTech Team. Our topic tonight is one that we struggle with when we're sometimes communicating with parents and community members and even our colleagues. Uh, so we're gonna get some answers to some of those questions that we all need some help with. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and screen share and, and get things started. So here we go. And so this month's webinar is, OK, Google, how safe is my data? You can find all of the resources, uh, including a link to this webinar, including all the slide decks that uh, slides that are trusted panelists are going to be sharing at edtech.team slash safe data webinar. We have with us this evening Lance Lennon from Eagle Grove uh, School District in Iowa, Ted Pennell from the Greater Victoria School District in Canada. So we're gonna have our US view and our Canadian view. And then our first speaker tonight is gonna be Hank Thiele from District 99 Downers Grove in Illinois. Hank is only gonna be with us about for about 15 minutes. So I'm gonna actually hand things over to him in just one moment. As I said, you can find all of the session resources for this webinar at edtech.team slash safe data webinar. And just like we do every month, at the end of the webinar, we give away a free just-in-time course from EdTech Team. So make sure to go ahead into the slide deck and click that link and get your information in there so that I can randomly pull a name at the end of the webinar to give away a course. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to thank in advance Hank for coming on tonight. He's got a parent meeting coming up pretty soon. So he's going to go over some really great information for us. Thanks so much, Hank. You're muted. All right, I'm up. Lisa, are you sharing the presentation or am I? Actually, it would be great if you did. All right. Uh, give me a second to pull that up. I was lost on that. But uh, while we get going, I'll kind of give everybody some background of uh, what we're going to talk about this evening. Uh, key to know about all of this is that Google Apps for Education has been out in the wild in K-12 settings. Uh, 2009, uh, the last school district I was at uh, was the first school district to go with it. It was uh, in Illinois, Maine 207. And uh, with them, uh, we started in beta really in 2007. By the 2008-9 school year, we were up and going. And uh, ever since then, the key concern by schools everywhere has obviously been uh, centered around the privacy and security of their data, which uh, was something that even when we started in 2007, we were concerned about, we were working with, uh, and we've been working with, uh, I particularly have been working with Google ever since then to make sure that we're clear to our um, clear to our education partners and, and colleagues as to uh, the safety, security, and privacy of their data, especially in relation to uh, student data and FERPA and all of those requirements. Um, of course, uh, Google is spinning on me right now. So uh, some of the key things that pull this up in a second as it comes up for me, but... Uh, Hank, would you like me to share my screen with the slides and just let me know when to go to the You're next aware of the Google's put together extensive. Uh, yeah, if you could pull it up on me here. I've got a bad connection, I think, here at school today. You got um, it. So I'm going to pull it up. So I'm going to pull it up. The superintendent have a good connection. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to pull the slide deck up for so, you. Yeah, really what, uh, where everybody should start when they begin this conversation is at the, uh, the Google Education website. Yeah, skip past that. There you go. So 
uh, where everybody should be going is that edugoogle.com, and I've shown you where just to click through to get there. Uh, so pretty simple. It's, you know, once you get through, make sure you're in the K-12 area. And then once you're in there, you're going to get to this page on privacy and security. Um, I've totally messed up Lisa here. So <laughs> go ahead and advance to the next one. So when you're going to see, this is the key spot where you really need to spend some time. And Google's been excellent in working with us in education to, um, to get these questions from us and then work hard to answer them. Uh, many of us, those that are probably here on the call, have given them uh, these questions over the years and have really hit them hard with uh, ensuring that they are answering the questions in a manner that our families are going to be comfortable with them. Uh, I always recommend to schools that are really looking to answer questions to go back to here, uh, not to try to make up the answers on your own. Uh, you have an agreement with Google that they're going to follow these privacy and security ideals. Make sure you're aware of that agreement and you're aware of the answers on this page. Um, many times as I get, get parent questions, especially around student information and privacy, I go right to the source here and uh, use their language and, and share it with parents to answer their concerns. Um, many times uh, what's out there is untruths. At least if you go to the next slide for me. Uh, it's, it's a lot of marketing material that gets circulated amongst parent groups. Um, and immediately after starting these presentations and, and sharing with other schools about this Google thing, uh, you know, back 10 years ago, uh, I got asked over and over again the same set of questions. Uh, and then out of that, this presentation came that's been circulated many times over uh, to answer the key questions that every school goes through. And a lot of this is those, that term FUD, this fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, it's misinformation that's circulated, sometimes intentionally, to drive people away from uh, educational tools like this. Um, early on, when I uh, started using Google, I kept telling uh, the administrators at Google that if they just charged somebody for this tool, uh, people would have a lot more confidence in it. Uh, people rarely question products that they're paying for. And the fact that Google is free and they've promised that it always will be tends to raise a lot of questions around ads and advertising and, and those kinds of things. Um, so those are the, the key things to, to make yourself aware of. Um, if you click through on that presentation at some point, you'll see a lot of those, those same themes that have been added over the years. And as Chromebooks came on the scene, uh, a new set of questions showed up that are now in that presentation. So um, I'd encourage you to go to that. So, Hank, should we stop for some questions right now? I know you have just a few minutes left. Sure. If there's a few out there, I'd be happy to take them on how this all got started and where to go for some help. Okay. Um, well, I actually have a question. Um, I was screen sharing, so I didn't get to yep. the chat as well. But my question is, you know, for the, for the typical parent, uh, or teacher that comes up and says, you know, how is this safe for my kids? Like, I know that you talk about that in Killing the FUD, but, you know, what what is the layman's answer to, you know, how safe are my kids, especially my kids that are under 13? Sure. Um, I think the simplest answer is that your data belongs to you. And that's what I always start with, is that Google is providing the vehicle for the information sharing but you as the school district retain the ownership and control over all of that information. Uh, so it's as secure and likely more secure than any data that your school is holding on to. Um, I trust Google's team of security and engineers because uh, it's huge uh, to maintain the privacy and security of our data uh, as much as my small little team can with as much resources as they have. So, um, 
But the key part is that Google's just the data processor. They're just pushing data around. Uh, you own it, maintain it, and, uh, and retain ownership of it. Great. Um, you know what? Thank you so much, Hank, for taking the time to stop by. And I know you have parents on the way, but we really appreciate your time. Yes, thanks for letting me be part of this, Lisa. Uh, you're, you're in good hands with these two experts here. I know we are. And we're actually going to turn things over to Ted now. So uh, Ted, uh, and I know that you have to log off, so we'll, 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 we'll manage without you. Um, Ted is speaking from the Canadian point of view. So I'm going to pass the, the camera over to him. And um, Ted, take it away. Go ahead and screen share and, and take it away for us. Okay, just uh, crossing over. Can you see that okay now? We sure can. Just go ahead and yeah. click present and you're good to go. Uh, what am I missing here? Oh, yep. Yeah. There, how does that look? Better? That's perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for including me in that conversation today. Um, I'm gonna give you the perspective from a British Columbia school district, uh, and we're in Victoria, Canada. School district, we have approximately 20,000 students. Um, within the last two or three years, our, our uh, infrastructure has grown, at least on the dual side. We have a uh, minimum 5,000 Chromebooks that are in use every day in the school district. Um, and, and really what I wanted to just go through here was the, my apologies, the, um, just a sense of the uh, privacy laws that we're bound by, which will certainly be different than um, some of our American counterparts there. So we, uh, within British Columbia, are bound by the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Uh, this is something that, that is overseen by the Office of the Privacy Commissioner. And as a school district, we, along with other public organizations, um, need to follow under the, the FIPA guidelines. Uh, I've got Lots of information here. I'm actually going to scan through it quickly, but if you have questions, I've also added some links. You can look at that. So re really the, the important thing here I wanted to, to state, um, personal information is identifiable information um, other than general contact information. Um, according to the Act, we need to pay attention to the collection, use, and disclosure of this data. So. As a public organization, we um, are allowed to collect information. However, if we collect it and this information resides outside of Canada, which it does in the case of Google, um, we need to do it with the user's consent. So that actually changes a lot of things, um, probably compared to uh, a school district that doesn't need to do that. So any school district within British Columbia that is going to use G Suite needs to do it um, with the user's consent. Uh, our kindergarten through grade eight, we request that the parents consent and the grades four to eight, we also request the students consent and our high school grades uh, eight, uh, nine through 12, um, we believe that consent uh, is good enough through the student themselves. So we have an automated process or a, an online process that students would be able to consent. Um, within Canada and outside of Canada, where data is stored uh, has different rules. Within Canada, um, it may not necessarily require the, the consent model. Um, as far as consent, uh, the regulation states we have to be clear around who the information will be disclosed to, uh, the purpose of the disclosure, and the date of when the consent is given, and, and also how long that consent is provided for. Um, there's also a lot of discussion in, in a consent model around, well, well, what is informed consent? And in our case, uh, 
we need to be very clear around what is it that they're consenting to and within the context of when they consented um, we have to be careful not to add additional services that they have not consented um, so we've actually gone to an annual process a consent process where every year we are asking parents and students to reconsent. Uh, one of the tools that the OIPC has created for us is called the Privacy Impact Assessment. And through our entire Google Suite for Education rollout and implementation, this is a template that we worked through that really addresses kind of the, the plan on how we're to use it, any concerns, uh, as well as um, basically th thinking through the entire implementation program. Um, it's, it's not a requirement, but it would follow under the, the area of due diligence. And uh, we've had a number of parents that have asked to see our PIA as well. Um, I've already mentioned FIPA is, is consent focused. A, a few things that we need to consider when using uh, G Suite is uh, the risk of third party information. So students can consent to themselves but we need to teach our students, and we do, and our teachers that the information that goes into Google from a personal perspective can only be about themselves and not about personal information of either their classmates or their parents or those that haven't consented. Um, it's a challenge, this disconnect between personal life and school life, and uh, it kind of falls under the good uh, digital literacy that we're teaching or, or digital citizenships our students and we are trying to apply best practices wherever possible. Uh, we have created a, a very detailed consent process. Um, I've added a link here. With our K-8, to as I said earlier, it, it is, uh, well, it's, it's paper-based. The consent form goes home. When the consent form comes back to the school, Somebody in the school can, we have a tool where they mark that consent has been given, and then we have an automated process from there that would spin up the account. Um, for the students, they can do that themselves online. Uh, we, we do have questions on occasion from parents, so addressing privacy concerns is, is uh, an important piece of this implementation. And we have approached this where we, we welcome conversations with parents and we feel that uh, addressing their concerns only makes our program stronger and better. Um, part of this program requires training. So training our teachers around what is personal information, what information can be shared within Google Suite, and what information and context should not be used in the tool. Uh, to date, we've done workshops. Uh, we've certainly got more work to do in this area, but training is a, is a critical component of a consent-based model. The, the other piece that needs um, close attention is around accommodations. So being consent-based, what does the teacher do if he or she had, has a parent or students that don't consent? So for example, say 28 or 30 kids consent and there's two parents that do not consent. The teacher still needs to find an alternate way to include the child. And uh, this can be a bit tricky too, because depending how the teacher is using the tool in the classroom uh, may not always be the same. So we are working with teachers to try to develop uh, some online guides and some supports around how they can create accommodations and create an environment that they can share this information with. And uh, that, that's about it. Uh, it, it. It's been a fantastic journey. I, I would say our use of Google Suite for Education has been transformative in our school district. We're, we are three to four years in now and uh, the the things that students are doing is, is just unbelievable and teachers, and it really is transforming the way that um, we use technology. So 
thank you very much. And I'm going to pass it back. Thank you, Ted. Actually, if you turn off your screen sharing, we have so many questions in the chat. And um, Lance, I invite you to answer those these as well. And maybe you're even going to answer some of these. Um, but I thought I'd, I'd stop just to, to post some of them. Um, the one question comes from Jody. And the question is, is this type of consent that parents have to give for their students to have this school Google accounts? Is this just once at the beginning of schooling? Or does this have to happen every year? So yeah, this is a consent that's required annually. And, and the, the reason for that is we may change some of the service offering that's included in that. Uh, so to be um, informed consent, we need to be able to provide in the, the, the um, information that they've actually consented to do, so annually. Great. Yeah, and Lisa, not, not knowing where Jody is from, um, I'll speak, I guess, from the southern side here, uh, not the southern side of the states, but of course, the southern side of the continent. Um, in Iowa and in the United States, ours is what we use implied consent. And it's basically our, our parents are told that our students will have access to Google, um, to Google for Education, included are these services. So unless you don't want that to happen, they will have it. So that's what we use implied consent and it's once per educational um, lifetime. So as long as they're in our district, they, they sign um, our acceptable use policy. That is the implied consent. It's all part of that. Um, it also builds in our, our Chromebook um, care and maintenance policy too. So it, it's once per, per schooling. Awesome. Thanks, Lance. Um, and, and also, I think the other question that it would be great to bring in from the chat right now is just uh, the parental or guardianship concern that what is Google going to do with this data that it's supposedly collecting when the child is a minor? What's it going to do with that data to that child later in life? Yeah, that's a, a question we've had a number of times. We take a good look at Google's privacy policy, Google for Education, and we carefully walk through that with the parents. Um, at the end of the day, it, it really is their decision. And if they're uncomfortable with it in any way, that's okay. And, and again, we will find accommodations to support their child, regardless of um, whether they're using Google or not. Great. I Thank think one thing to look at that, Lisa, is, you're never going to, you have to realize that Google is Google. Um, so when you are using the Google tools, they have basically ported that over to an educational setting, but it's still doing the same stuff in the background. So it it is, and they aren't lying to you. They aren't telling you it's not. They never once said, we're not collecting data. They do collect data, but they do not use that data. And that is very explicit in their um, privacy statement that that data is stored elsewhere. It's stored on, on separate devices, but they're not gonna reconfigure these applications. They're not gonna reconfigure their tools just for education. They're just gonna store it separately and not use it. So what does it do for the kids? In the end, nothing. The, the, that data, once that account is deleted, um, if you have not created a backup of it, um, you know, whatever re Google's retention policy is, then once that is gone, it's gone and it's not going to affect them in the future. So that's that's the biggest thing is everybody says, well, Google is, is that's what they do. Yeah, that is what they do. Google is a data collection, but they agree they will not use your students' data. And think well, about it. If they ever got caught doing that, how bad that publicity would be. I mean, look at what happened with Apple when they found out, you know, that yes, we are tweaking the, the performance to, to save battery life, there was a huge backlash. And Google's not gonna, gonna wanna face that. So they aren't gonna lie to you and say we're not using it and then use it. And I'm sorry I stepped on you there, Ted. No, it's okay, I'm competing with an ambulance out here. No, no, nor does Google share that information, which is an important message um, that parents do want to hear. And, and Michelle Armstrong's in the chat, and you know she brought up an interesting point that Google's not the only organization storing data. I mean, Facebook, Amazon, so many companies, and, and including those companies working in the education realm. Let's give Lance a chance to go over slides, and then I think we're going to have some additional questions at the end of that as well. Uh, while uh, just before 
just before we start that, I'm going to screen share one more time. We've had some folks, you know, that have stepped in a little bit, you know, just in the last couple of minutes into the webinar. So I just want to uh, reiterate that all of the resources for today, everything, you can find at edtech.team slash safe data webinar. There's a form there for you to complete if you want to uh, be entered to win a free online course from EdTech Team. And uh, we'll also be embedding the webinar there there as well. Uh, having said that, I'd like to go over to our third and final speaker for the evening, Lance Lennon, who comes to you from Iowa. So uh, Lance, I'm going to hand things over to you. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and pop over here and away we go. So yes, I am in Iowa where we measure our temperature this time of year as to how fast um, our face will freeze. Today, they told us it was a whole 20 minutes before frostbite. So good day. Uh, so Lance Lennon, uh, Technology Director for the Eagle Grove Schools in Eagle Grove, Iowa. We've been a Google for Education uh, school district. I really, I, I want to say seven, eight years. Um, we're one-to-one -one Chromebooks in grades five through 12, uh, technically one-to-one -one in three through four, but the five through 12 take them home. And so we've, we've had a lot of questions, same thing with, with the parents, you know, how safe is the data? How safe is all of our stuff? And when we talk about Google, I, I just cannot stress enough, when they talk security, when you think about it, everything from their browser to their operating system to their, their user information, it's fairly secure. It's, it's probably the most secure web browser out there, the secure operating system. Why would they, they wanna be letting things go lax on the data side? Um, you've never crossed our fingers, heard of a Google data breach yet. So I think that they are pretty good. Some of the stuff we like to really do in our district is because when you ask how safe is my data, we don't worry as much about the Google side of things as we do about our human side of things. And our biggest thing Oh no, we lost layouts. <laughs> <laughs> so while we're waiting for Lance to come back in, Ted, hopefully he didn't have a power outage. I did have a question. Um, and my question was with regards to third party apps, extensions, add ons. You know, I worked with a group of seventh and eighth grade teachers yesterday that really didn't want to use any of those things because they didn't want to open up. Um, their their Google Drive or their Gmail or their webcam to a third party application. How do you typically address that? That's a good good question. It's something that we're continually trying to work our way through. Um, through the admin console, we can um, open some up by default, um, but but it's an issue that we're actually still struggling to in the larger picture figure out how to deal with. And and you know we. I mean, for us on the privacy front, really, it's kind of all the web 2.0 apps out there as well. So it's really no different than uh, other systems that our, our teachers might be going to use. Does that make any sense? Oh, it absolutely makes sense. Um, what are the, the typical policies, though? So I know some districts that I work with in the United States um, they block the add-ons and extensions so that teachers can't install them. They can only install what the district has it approved. What, how do you handle that in your district? Yeah, we, we do have some that are blocked. Um, we are in the process of going through a, a full audit right now on which ones that, that we're dealing with, as well as our entire admin console from the perspective of a privacy lens. So that, that's kind of a work in progress for us right now. We're going to see if we can get Lance. Thank you so much, Ted. We're going to see if we can get Lance back on here. <laughs> uh, and I'm a little bit concerned that maybe he has a, a power outage. Um, and he's not going to make it back in because if he just had to restart Chrome, he'd be back in already. Uh, so, uh, some of the things that Lance was going to talk about, which I, I think that um, Ted could probably address well, is that your staff really needs to be trained. 
right? You want your teaching staff, of course, your administrators, but you also want your teaching staff to be able to speak intelligently about all of this with regards to parents and with regards to students and digital citizenship. Do you have a specific digital citizenship curriculum or program that you use in your district? Uh, we, we don't. We're, we're looking at developing one. Our, our schools each have their own. Uh, I, I could speak a little bit too about the role of our administrators in this. I, so the same thing applies to them. We are uh, working with them to make sure they understand the privacy aspect as well, because uh, often parents will go to them before they they will come at it to myself at a district level, uh, as well as we want to inform our community, right? Our community of teachers and principals have a a huge influence within that. So, yeah, I, I would imagine so. And I know a lot of districts are, you know, in the United States, we're going with Common Sense Media, and there's some other products out there as well. Um, one of the things that Lance was going to talk about was just those Google reports and the usage statistics. Uh, Ted, are you utilizing those tools in your district? And if so, how? Uh, you know what, to be honest, we are not uh, so much, and, and that's something else we're looking at improving. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, oh, yeah, and uh, Lori in the chat just mentioned the new Google curriculum for grades three to five, which is the Be Internet Awesome curriculum, which is, is, is really super great, and uh, we've actually talked a little bit about that. Um, oh, great. Thanks, Lori. So Lance had just started talking about two-step authorization and how this can be implemented with kids under the age of 13. I know personally I use two-step authorization, but um, Ted, not to totally put you on the spot, but um, are you utilizing that uh, personally or within the district and are you utilizing it with students under the age of 13? Yeah, so, so the two-step authentication, we have not um, mandated that, so, so we've not set that to happen. Um, yeah, so, so let, me, let me explain the process in, in our school district. So um, a teacher in elementary or middle school typically will put consent letters out to their parents at the beginning of the school year. They will uh, to take a period of time to receive those all back. And then we have a tool that they can use that they would just click on the student's name to say, yes, I've received consent. And behind the scenes, it automatically spins up the Google account for the student and it informs them uh, of their credentials to log into. Um, and, and I think I said this with, with our, our high school students, we have an online tool because they can log in and we can authenticate who they are. Uh, they're able to create create one as well, but uh, we we've also we have a separate domain with our our Google than our school district domain um, managed uh, through the Google Admin Console as well. So, uh, like within our our school domain here, we we don't offer students email, but we do through our uh, G Suite offering on the yeah at sd61learn.ca domain. Awesome, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna just quick screen share with you all. I don't think it looks like Lance is coming back. Um, maybe they had some bad weather, uh, unfortunately. Uh, I'm gonna quick screen share and get back to the slide deck. Uh, we stop for questions. Uh, it's the last chance to complete that form to win a free online course from EdTech Team. We offer 15 hour just in time courses uh, valued at $149 a course. Uh, we encourage you to learn more and stay connected with EdTech Team on Twitter, uh, in our Google Plus community, or at edtechteam.com. And of course, you know, go ahead and share the link to the slide deck. I'll be embedding tonight's webinar in there as well at edtech.team slash safe data webinar. 
Uh, we've got a link, you know, some session follow-up, a link to the archive webinar, a link to the archive chat for tonight, a link if you'd like to request a workshop with EdTech team, and we did just launch our brand new Ignite You series of workshops, so make sure to check that out, or to get a PD certificate for one hour of professional development for tonight's webinar. So the question is, who's going to win the online course? And I like to use a website called the Name Picker Ninja. I'm going to keep screen sharing. I'm going to head over. Oh, Lance is back. Lance, what happened? Lance? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Did you lose power? I have no idea. No, I was still going. I looked to me like I was still connected. I came back to stop sharing my screen. I went through my whole presentation by myself. Oh, no. <laughs> well, we did really. Um, Ted was amazing and went through a lot of what you were talking about. We talked about the Google two step author, uh, author authentication a little bit, but they're not using it in Ted's school. So, would you mind talking a little bit? You can screen share, you can stay on the screen, but would you talk a little bit about how you're using um, the two step authentication with either students and or staff? Absolutely. So we um, we do not use it with our students um, at this time. We really are considering it, but our staff is required. We, we enforce two-step authentication. We allow them to um, choose their method of two-step authentication, whether it be through a text message to their phone, whether they're using LastPass, which can then also act as your two-step authentication. I personally use the Google Authenticator app on my phone. Um, I store, I, I have a lot of different accounts and a lot of different domains. So I'm actually using it for all of them. That's the way I do. And then we have other staff that, you know, they, they don't want to use their phone. Um, so we supply that YubiKey, that little software or hardware piece, that, that USB key. Um, I spoke that if you went to ISTE in Denver and happened to go to the Google presentation room, they gave away that summer that uh, zippered bag of security tools. And in there was a YubiKey. It's about $15 a piece for the school district, and it's handy to have. So you have to have. So two-factor authentication means not only do I have my password, but I then have a second form to um, authenticate I am who I say I am. The last thing you can do is you can actually print out a series of 10 numbers that are one-time use, and as soon as you use them, they can't be used again. They can generate those numbers and have that sheet of paper with them. And then what's really important is to tell them, make sure you check the box that says, remember me for 30 days, if they're, especially if they're using the, the printed codes. Because if they don't at that point use those printed or click the remember me for 30 days, they'll go through those 10 codes rather quickly. And you can always regenerate more codes and print them also. So as a, a serious backup, I do have one of those in my wallet for, for a couple of my accounts too. But so two factor we force on our, our staff and make them use that. It's just like I said, another way that we really do see as we know Google's protecting our data. What's really important is that we do our due diligence to protect our data also. And that's as I went through the slide deck and I'm sorry that I got disconnected, Lisa. This seems to be the night of, of malfunctions between Hank and I. Um, yeah. But um it's, we, well, we have a question from the chat. Um, does collecting data mean storing data or when collected, it, it can be mined, right? So what's the difference between collecting data and the storage of the data? Well, so depending when they talk and my, my guess is when they're asking about it is, so Google has that data tied to that user account for as long as that user account exists. Um, so technically, yes, it is stored. But the deal is that the education in the United States, and, and my guess is the same in Canada. I haven't looked at the agreements with Canada. But in the United States, that data is not stored where other user data for Google users is stored. So if you have a personal Gmail account or you have a business domain, that is different than a school account. And it's stored separately. And so they do technically store the data, but it's your data you have control over it. They don't sell it. They don't give it out and they don't use it for their own purposes, which is why when I go into the Google search engine um, as a, a person from educational uh, domain, you don't see the ads on the side. You don't see the, 
the personalized search fields. Like if I go to my, my personal Gmail account and I open up Google on the side, I usually get a whole bunch of um, Bass Pro Shop ads. I happen to do some shopping there. I search a lot on Bass Pro Shop. So naturally Google knows, oh, this guy likes fishing, fishing stuff. So that's there, but it's not there in the education side. That's how you, that's the easiest way to tell your data is separate and not being used by Google. Oh, I love that. That's super reassuring. And and while we're on the topic of just being secure, would you talk briefly, Lance, about the um, the password requirements that you use? Yeah. So our requirements are, and we we are different than a lot of places. Is our students are given a password every year. They cannot change their password, and I have a list of all of those passwords. And the reason I do that is because two reasons. One. It's, I know there's the possibility that anytime a student forgets their password, I can just change their password, but I don't want to have to do that. That's kind of a pain in my rear. But two is I at any point also now can go in as that student and look at their information. So they understand that, especially in Iowa, data and things tied to our school's domain is no different than a locker. And it is accessible via a properly held search. So it is school owned, not individual owned. So I have the ability to go in and look at their stuff. Prime example, we had a student, a teacher call me and say, hey, they they said that they did their um, slide deck and it just disappeared. Look in their account um, and I went right to the trash, figured I'd wonder what happened. And I opened up the slide deck and sure enough, there's three slides in it. They have the title slide and the first two. And I said, well, how many slides did they have? And they said, well, they said they have like 30 slides. And I said, no. And then as I went to go back to it and refresh it, it said it's been emptied from the trash. Well, in the process, the student had deleted the slide deck and then emptied the trash to say it just disappeared. No, it didn't just disappear. You tried to get away with something and you got caught because I had your password. So I like to do that. Um, but we do have password requirements where it is word number combinations. But one thing I talked about was when it comes to passwords, what's really kind of uh, people always talk about changing passwords and best practice is three to six months. That's technically what you're supposed to change. I don't really like that because the more frequently you change a password, the more likely you are to have it written down somewhere or for it to be easier to guess or for it to be some derivative of another password. And you're likely to use more similar passwords. What I'm trying to teach my staff is don't use passwords, use phrases. I guess it's a great password really hack is going to get that. It's something you're going to remember. It's something that, that, that is in there. And it usually meets lengthwise um, the, the qualifications. Now, it doesn't have special characters. It doesn't have numbers. And if you really get really secure, you can do that. I personally also use LastPass. So I don't remember a lot of my own passwords. I just let LastPass. And now I've gotten to the point where I even let LastPass create them. And so it's like, oh, I need a new password? LastPass. Make a password and remember it. So all I have to remember is my LastPass password so I can get in. But passwords are huge. You have to have good pass. And it's, I said it's it's no different. You're securing your data and you want to make sure you have your data secure. Um, so it's uh, really important to teach your teachers. It's no different than when they first started teaching. If they had a file cabinet with their tests and all of their, their, their information for their classes, their outlines, their quizzes, their worksheets, they didn't just leave that file cabinet wide open and walk out of a full classroom. And yet, how many times does a teacher walk away with their computer still logged in, just sitting there and don't think about it? Um, we just have to be diligent. If you look at the slide deck, it'll show you the different types of attacks that are out there. And the one I talked about that I really, a lot of us don't think about is the over the shoulder attack is people can read lips and we always knew people could read lips. But what we don't realize is how many people can read keystrokes now. They actually are training themselves to learn what your password would be. They can even tell when you're hitting a shift key and they're training very well to just, just glance over your shoulder. So you put in your password. You think it's secure because all that comes across is circle, 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 circle. But a keyboard and seeing what your password is. So it's really, it's a very interesting time. That's why I love LastPass. And, and Michelle, if you drop a link to lastpass.com in, in the chat. Oh, I'll, have, I'll drop a, a link. 
But um, I use the random password generator because it's just, you know, you tell it that you need eight characters or 12 characters and you tell it capital or lowercase, special characters, no special characters. And then all you have to remember is that master password. Which brings me to another question from the chat, a couple more questions, and then Lance, I'd like to kind of end things with you talking about the Google reports and the statistics that you use. Um, the first question is, uh, you talked about how you keep all of the students' passwords and you manage the student passwords. What about the staff passwords? So we generate staff passwords again at the beginning of the year. Um, and same thing, I do have a list of all my staff passwords. Uh, the difference is we allow them to change the password if they want. Um, it does have to go through me. They can't do it manually because that setting in the domain setting for Google is, is domain wide. So when I go in and say, I redirect the password page to a, a, just a, you know, a page on our website that says you shouldn't change your password, Dr. Mr. Lennon. So they can change their passwords. Um, but again, it's one of those things as the IT director, how many times does someone say, Hey, can you look at my account? Well, yeah, I can, but I don't have your password or, you know, I go there and you're not there and how am I going to get in? The biggest issue I run into now is because I have two-step authentication turned on is I then have to go into the admin council and generate a, a, the codes for them and use one of those codes for two-step. And then they freak out and they're like, I got a text that said someone tried to get in and use the, I'm like, yeah, it was me. I was just looking at your account. But so our staff can change their password, but we prefer that, you know, they have to ask me. Um, and that's just on the Google side. We, the other tools we use, they maintain their own passwords on. Great. And, and I just want to just revisit and confirm something with you that uh, we, that the district owns the data, right? Mm -hmm. the district yes. owns the data in a Google Apps Education Edition account and that it is not being mined. Correct. It is owned by the district and it is not being mined by Google. It is stored, but they're not, it's, it's, like I said, the only reason it's being stored is because that's their process. That is what, you know, that's how they design their, their program. They have separated out Google for Education data, so it is stored, but it's stored separately and it's not being mined or used. And, and like I said, the best way to test it Let's go to the, the Google, um, the search engine and see if ads pop up. See if, you know, if anything's coming up on the site. It's just like if you go to Facebook, same thing. I get all kinds of Bass Pro Shop ads on Facebook too. So, and Amazon seems to know what I buy. And they always seem to suggest something that I just need. You need this. I'm like, I do. How did you know? I like that Facebook recommends stuff to me that I've already bought. <laughs> <laughs> so but you need another one. Yeah, you need it again. <laughs> So the last thing that I'd like you to talk about before we just kind of bring things to a close today are the Google reports that you have in the slide deck, the managing alerts, logins and changes, drive access and updates, and the email log. Yeah. So we, um, again, I, I am the, the domain administrator for our district and I go in and I set up these alerts. Um, one is suspicious, suspicious login activity. So Google, like I said, they store your data. They know where your users normally log in from, what, where the IP addresses are, what the geolocation is. And all of a sudden, if they get one that's outside those parameters, it sends me an update or an, an email. Say, hey, a suspicious login. This person just logged in in Szechuan, China. At which point I would say, huh, probably not them. Let's, let's look at this. Logged in in Fort Dodge, and they're normally logged in Eagle Grove, Fort Dodge being a town 30 miles away. I'm like, high likelihood that that's them. Not a lot of hackers from Fort Dodge, Iowa. Um, so I can tell, so I get the suspicious activity alert. We also have, um, I just wanna make sure I get the right ones that I talk about on the email or on the reports. Um, the login and changes. So if, like I said, the suspicious logins, but I also have the login challenges set up. So now Google has set up another layer of security that if you are logging in from somewhere that you maybe don't normally log in from, it can actually challenge you and, and, and bring up questions or ask you for information or get stuff from you so that it finds out if it's really you. And so I do also get emails based on those. The drive access updates, um, I have an alert set up so that if any new um, third party tools are installed in my domain, not by me, actually by anyone. If they're ever installed, I get an email update that says, hey, access was 
uh, allowed for Lucid Press. And I'm like, yeah, I did that. I know that that was me as the admin. If something comes up and says, you know, Pokemon Go just got access to your domain. No, I didn't do that. Let's take a look at this and what's going on. And then the email log, what's very important is that I get um, keeping my history. It's not so much a report that I have that generates, but one that is constantly coming from um, going in and being able to look at who emailed who and when it came. So I can find out looking through what's going on in my domain. It's like anything else. I have to do my due diligence to make sure that our data and our users are safe on our end. And I am a one person shop. I, I do have a, a technician, but when it comes to the, the higher level IT stuff, I'm a one person shop, about one fifth the side of, of Ted. So I hope Ted that you're a five person shop. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, I just do what I can and, and setting up these automated things through Google has really helped me to get the emails to to be able to search real quickly um, and go through and find out did this person email that person no it's probably a phishing scam let's put the kibosh on it that's great thanks so much uh, Lance we're glad that you made it back <laughs> Um, so we had already kind of started doing our closing together and we talked about, you know, how to submit to win a free ed tech team course and how to get your PD certificate. So I'm not going to do that all again. Um, not to put you on the spot, Ted, but I just wanted to give you an opportunity if there's anything else that you wanted to add. Uh, you, you know what? I, I don't think so, but I would just extend you, you have my contact information if there's any questions out there. I'd be happy to connect personally with uh, anybody or any, on any questions. I really appreciate that. Thanks so much. This has been a wealth of information. And I know even what we've been talking about tonight, some of it I could have used over the last week in professional development that I've been doing to just be more informed about uh, the laws and, and how everything works. I'm going to quick screen share one more time. Switch over to me. And... I'm going to bring out Name Picker Ninja. I've gone and pasted in all of the names of the folks that have submit, and I've submitted the Google form, and I'm going to click go. And we've got, hope I can pronounce it, Lori Baird. You are the winner of the free EdTech Team online course tonight. And uh, what will happen is, Lori, is I will be sending you an email introducing you to our director of online learning later on this evening or tomorrow morning so that you can claim your course. So I want to thank everyone again for coming to this month's teaching and learning webinar. We'll be announcing soon uh, what we have in store for you for February. Lance, Hank, who's, you know, had to go. And Ted, thank you so much for your time this evening. Have a great day.